yeah, I'm, I'm actually not digging that much into the um, into the ten principles as much as is a little bit more the broader sustainability themes. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, um, yeah, this is really more about the team than me, but um, and I think this is also something I'm probably preaching to the choir. But hopefully, there are a few things here that um, that will will be some food for thought as we go on. You know, why we're doing this? I think we all know that we're in this realm of overshoot and and have been for a number of decades now, where our bio capacity is greater than our 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 ecological footprint is greater than our bio capacity. And the date at which we reach that overshoot day seems to be moving um, earlier and earlier during the year, um, ever since we've been in these deficits, um, again, several several decades now. Um, ironically, the only places that you see a little bit of, of improvement and resetting of that are usually when there's some sort of economic downturn. Um, you can match those with those or the COVID year. You know, so COVID, um, it was was a little bit better for the planet in some sense, but it it recovered right as it did, you know, immediately after that again. Um, and you know, a lot of our motivation is this idea that we shouldn't be treating symptoms, and we focus too much on the things in the outside of that circle as the actual manifestations of the problems. But we don't focus on the center and the system of ideas, which is uh, the originator of those those other things. And um, in many ways, you know, calling for a paradigm shift is is um, you know easy to say and hard to do, but we say that we you know this is a flawed relationship that we have with nature and and really with ourselves, and therefore we keep making these mistakes. And I like to challenge my students to come up with one of our current environmental problems we have today that was not the solution to yesterday's problems because it seems like we keep making these mistakes over and over again, um, and and they just you know they might be a short term or very short term fix, but um, but not a long term, not not a long term solution. So, what is that paradigm shift that we need? We need to rethink about environment. We think we need to, we need to think about life. And when regarding the environment, you know, the main thing we get wrong about environment is that we we draw systems boundaries around things. We have to do that for, for practical reasons, but then we think the environment is somehow separate and fragmented from that system, and we see environment as something out there and not really touching us and not really part of us when in fact we know that that is a is a is a flawed perspective and and we can use network environment theory and other approaches to to recenter the object as the focus of two environments so we are constantly connecting to our environment in as the, the part that's affecting us and the part that we are affecting and this input output environment orientation is is the process based as bob alerted to earlier it's not about objects it's about the processes that are flowing into and out of uh, those objects or systems. So, um, you know, and I think that the two questions any every systems thinker is always asking is where is it coming from is where and where is it going? It's this, it's this flow, this process mentality that we have. And I mentioned that using network approaches and environment analysis, that there's ways of quantifying and, and, um, and tracking and, and uh, measuring the influence that all of those direct and indirect influences have in a complex network, even if you include feedbacks that are taking the output world into the input world again. So objects are self self uh, determining in many sense because they have this ability to, to pay it forward through these feedbacks. Um, yeah, another thing about the, the problem that we have is the fragmentation. What we get wrong about life is that we think that life is a machine. We have this machine metaphor that is running through much of what we are think about and do. Even something like a composting, uh, you know, as, as as organic as you can think, making new soil from from food waste, they call it an earth machine because the the paradigm runs so deep. And so we see the world as a machine, and we've turned the world into a machine. And um, and what do machines do? They break down, they run out of fuel, they need they need maintenance, and so on. Um, but that's not what we observe in nature, right? So, so the the objective observations are that that ecosystems improve over time. They continually self-organize, self-repair after disturbance. There's lots of examples of soil formation, of uh, ozone uh, atmosphere and, and ozone layer that are all um, aggrading and improving uh, over time. So this this idea that, that ecosystems are running down and wearing out is 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 not what we see. And so it's a we need to you know change that metaphor. So there are a lot of win-wins, as, as Sally mentioned before, the, the, the synergism and mutualisms that are that are going out there. So one of our approaches to uh, address that, which was actually an earlier paper with Dan and Sally, was um, 
constructing this like life environment um, unification. So when we talk about life, we know that it's a life environment complex. And so we, we want to always keep those together, which, you know, as we say, formally prohibits fragmentation of life from the environment, produce this hyperset equation where environment is both inside the organisms because we're made up of the molecules of life, but environment is also outside the, the ecosystems because it is the context in which we all uh, function and perform. So, so this idea of having this nested uh, equation where environment is both inside and outside, um, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll uh, do away with this, with this fragmentation that we have. Um, so what are some other things that we can potentially learn from nature? Um, I won't go through this, this whole list, but this was um, some work that, that came out not too long ago. Bob was a co-author on this as well, the second edition of our new ecology book. And we, uh, after much brainstorming, as much as I don't like lists, I know the 10 properties are a list, and this is a list of nine different properties. Lists always leave me thinking we either you know, excluded one or included too many, and how will we ever know? But anyways, what we came up with, again, after many iterations and brainstorming and additions, Three material constraints, which I think are, are okay. They're grounded in the first and second laws of thermodynamics and, and the chemistry of the periodic table. So that seems to be okay. Then we came up with these two, what we refer to as ontological properties, which are the things that biology can do. And the first one we refer to as physically driven biological aspect. And what that means is that the physics of life is that it's able to move further away from thermodynamic equilibrium. It takes in energy flows and it degrades them and builds them and and create structures. But then the second part is the biologically driven aspect, which is that ecosystems um, are actually able to evolve and adapt um, and modify it, its environment. So there's both, there's the, that, that, that's what biology is doing unique that, um, that physical systems, obviously social ecological systems do it, but we don't, we don't see that in just physical systems. And the last four of these properties were um, the observed properties, things in terms of high diversity, which is very consistent with the, the bridge out of economics, the fact that there are networks, the fact that there's hierarchies, and that there's a lot of information. So, so these are all different um, dimensions and snapshots of, of what ecosystems do. So I actually have additional slides to go into each of those in more detail. I, I, I won't do that unless there is some, some specific questions that, that we have about that, but this is kind of the under underpinning approach towards understanding how ecological systems work and then trying to um, apply those concepts and theories to how social economic systems work. So that's where a lot of, of I think the, the, the movement into things like urban metabolism, regenerative economy, regenerative economics stems from, from that, uh, that thinking. So um, just a few more slides. I, I, I want to say that one of the things that we can observe in networks, is, as Sally mentioned, is this idea of network mutualism. And um, network mutualism comes from not only the interconnections, but the, the, the feedbacks, the cycling that goes on there, the, the top down and bottom up trophic cascades and so on. And, um, and as I mentioned, ecological network analysis is a methodology that we can use to, to identify those relations, but one of the things I've been thinking about recently is that we focus so much on negative externalities and we are trying to minimize negative externalities. And of course, that's a fine thing to try to do, but what we're not doing is we're not aware of the loss of positive externalities. So the world is also full of positive externalities A well-functioning network has mutualisms that are, that are just embedded in that functioning. And as we continue to snip at the networks and prune them and, and, and destroy them, we are losing a lot of positive externality. And so the spillover benefits that you get from being in a network, I think that we're losing it. And that's kind of a hidden loss because it's not, it's a, yeah, I don't know the exact, uh, Bob would know on the, in the logic, the, the, the lack of having something is different than, than, you know, actually losing something. But anyways. Um, Apophasis. Apophasis, thank you, Bob. Yeah, so I think that that's what's going on here is that these networks are being um, pruned in a way that we're, we're losing the positive spillovers and we didn't even know about them before and, and we're losing them. So yeah, one of the ways that we look at this is in terms of circular economies and, and knowing that there are more positive uh, feedbacks and, and uh, not just positive feedbacks, positive spillovers. 
in, in circular economies, so trying to move away from the linear model. This is very consistent with the regenerative economics approach as well, too, with the cross scale and, and all those other properties. Mm -hmm. So um, so just, you know, I think that this also fits together in this idea of the limits to growth and Jane Jacobs' work and, and others that were, um, that were talking about what we need to do is recognize limits, but not, not, um, not be afraid of the limits, right? I, I like her line, line though, they're invitations to work along with them, you know, acknowledge them, greet them, work with them and, and, and do, do what we can within those limits. Um, our effort to address that was within our book, Flourishing Within Limits to Growth, again, taking an ecological perspective, but understanding that ecosystems do flourish within the constraints that they have and, um, and, and don't seem to be bent out of shape, the fact that they, that they can't grow forever um, on a small patch. So some of the conclusions could be that um, you know, the, the current approach that we have is not working um, and it's particularly not sustainable on our finite planet, but it's not even solving the problems that it's intended to solve. So we, we continue to have inequality, we continue to have unemployment and so on. So more of the same that's not working is not going to get us there. So some of the actions could include mimicking better ecosystem dynamics, um, again, living within the input and output limits that we have, the reliable inputs, healthy outputs, building the structures based on those within the circularity of exchanges. It might involve rescaling human activity within the context of the global biosphere, not an easy task, but um, if we're over, if we're on overshoot, one of the first things you should do is try to reel it in a little bit um, and not be an overshoot. And um, yeah, trying to re reinstate those positive spillovers through community networks particularly community networks that respect for place. And when I say place, I mean soil. And soil is the basis for, for, um, for life. I mean, that's where, where it all comes together. So this is how I, I hope that we can um, you know, flourish with nature, society, and ecology together. And then maybe just some last take-homes. I love the blue marble photo. It's about wholeness, about fragmentation, emergent and organic, not a machine and learning to celebrate the limits. So these are kind of the messages that I am uh, promoting everywhere I can at the moment. So I don't know if there are any immediate questions or clarifications on that. Uh, yeah, Bob, uh, a question on slide number 12, nine properties of ecosystems. Yeah. And the question is on number eight. Yep. Uh, yeah. Ecosystems are emergent hierarchically I think I'm trying to understand when people use the word hierarchically, you know, how they're using the word, because I see it used in so many different ways. And I'm yeah. curious if you have anything you could say about that. Yeah. The slide that I would show you would be, um, in fact, I'll, I'll jump down to it, would be, um, whoops, this one, right? So when we think of ecosystems and the hierarchy going all the way from atoms up to biosphere, and each one of those is a different level, that at that level, there is process and function and information, but it's embedded in a higher system and a lower system. Um, you could even probably go back to Hessler's idea of holons and these, these holistic particles. And each one then is connected uh, upward and downward in, in the other um, organizational structures. And I think that's what Sally was referring to in terms of you need small banks, you need medium banks, you need large banks. And so there's, a, there's an emergent hierarchy in order to have the system function properly. Um, if, if you have everything flat, then, then it, you can't reach all, all endpoints. It's, it's either too big or, or, it's, or it's too inefficient. And so, so having, having a hierarchy emerge is, 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 again, these were the observations that we had about ecosystems. Hierarchies e exist in ecosystems or in, in ecology. I don't know if, that, if, if you agree with that or make sense, or that's, but that's how our thinking was in this. Well, so why, uh, what do you, when you say, why, why use ecosystems are as opposed to energy systems? I mean, I keep, I mean, for me, a lot of this has to do with how you, how do you frame yeah. this idea in, in order to get it across to the widest, you know, community possible people. And my sense is that e ecology and ecosystems have, and sustainability have really you know they 
you know, they're now embraced by what 85% of the world's population believes in those kinds of things. Right. Um, but it doesn't help you with the other problems, with the economic problems, with the, and framing it as ecosystems, I think, just makes you make people think, oh, this is just more sustainability as, as usual, as opposed to getting at the root problem with the cultural system that we're currently embracing. So these are energy flow systems, but there's also there's other things going on there, too. There's evolution. There's things that, that wouldn't be included if you if you just took an energy perspective. I, I wouldn't evolution that, be part of the energy well, I don't think there's any any rules that that would include that. I mean, that, that was that biologically driven biological aspect, right? That's something that life does. That's a property of, of life. Um, energy systems do move further from thermodynamic equilibrium and they do a grade and they do those things. But um, yeah, I mean, it's I think it's it's probably semantics, but it's, you know, I, I don't know that this particular figure is harder to understand because it has an ecological perspective, because people understand the idea of a population and then a community and, and an ecosystem. Um, but if, but it's, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I said, if I if I could defend ecology, OK, the thing about it is that that energy is what uh, Bateson calls pleroma. OK, it's a homogeneous thing. And the beauty of it, as you've pointed out, Sally, is that you can apply it to economic ecosystems, stars, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is that uh, the world is is heterogeneous, majorly heterogeneous. And physics cannot deal with heterogeneity, only with homogeneity. We've known this for over 100 years since uh, uh, Whitehead and Russell and so forth, that, uh, uh, that, that the laws of physics, the logic of the laws of physics is based on uh, operations according to homogeneous sets. And uh, once you get into the heterogeneous world, you know, you've, you've, you've you have influences that 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 cannot be explained simply by energy. Uh, anyway, that's enough. <laughs> well, actually, so I would have said that um, classical physics is certainly, uh, you know, adverse to uh, homo uh, heterogeneity, as you might call it. But for me, that's the whole point of why nonlinear dynamics and non-equilibrium thermodynamics are, you know, support the broader picture of how physics and energy flow works. So I would have said that the reason energy flow applies to all of these things is that it it creates emergent properties. So whenever it it self organization produces a new form of organization, it, ha it that new form of organization obeys the old laws, the some universal laws of energy flow. But then they also um, have unique have laws that are unique to them. That's the whole emergent you know idea, and so. Ecosystems are too are you know an outcome of energy flow processes, and it has certain they have certain uh, rules that apply to ecosystems, but they and but human systems have other laws that don't that also don't apply in ecosystems or don't match with ecosystems. If that makes any sense to you, so uh, I, if I could, I'd interject. Uh here. Uh, good to see you, Sally, first of all. And secondly, uh, I have to concur with Bob's analysis here. Bob uh, is pointing out uh, a very basic physical conception of dynamical systems, that is the continuity of the variables. And uh, the diagram in the slides that was given uh, is definitely not a dynamical diagram. It That's is a true. structural diagram. And it is structural diagram of very specific uh, organized systems of existence. So there's an existential quality to the diagram that is, uh, if you would, a static picture of different scales of uh, organization or different scales of being. And so uh, I concur with Bob that the notion of energy here is not adequate to de express the heterogeneity of nature. Good to see you again, Jerry. Jerry and I go back to the uh, 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 a group in Washington, D.C. also, uh, founded in the early 80s, uh, uh, the EL, uh, to environmental... WESS. 
WESS. Yes, yes. Washington that, Evolutionary Systems. Yes, Society. thank you, Jason. Thank you. Your, your memory is better than mine. Actually, I was a I young student you. for, for that group. <laughs> Actually, Bob, that's where I met you. That's where I heard, first heard you, you give a talk. Absolutely. That's where we met. Yeah. May I ask one question? Go ahead, please, Boris. Uh, yeah, I just uh, didn't clearly understand what a, what it means input environment and what it means output environment. Yeah, um, let me go ahead and and uh, oops, share this slide. Again. Brian has a slide for that. Yeah. Um, so this is the basis of uh, Bernie Patton's environ theory. And, and the idea, and it, and it dates back also a century of von Oichsgall's work and, and so on, that uh, uh, where the, the every object is the center of two different environments. And so the environment then is, the, is that space, that process that is leading everything, all the flows directly and indirectly into that object. So you can, you can formalize uh, theoretically and can, and computationally what that input environment is everything that that affects a, 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 a focal point in your system and then the output environment is everything that is generated from that from that point outward into the environment again and and of course there can be feedback there can be um, these function circles but but it's a way of, of recognizing that at any moment that that object is is both receiving and generating flows and so it's it's a way of of breaking down that 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 hard barrier that has this fragmentation, right? The, the system boundary is typically thought. I mean, it can be porous or permeable, but that's still not the same as the. Pro it's a more of a process orientation of of thinking about the each you know each object, right? Is really a, a continuous of flows. Well, it's like uh, whatever you eat at the drink. Uh, yes, it is the input the input of your body, yeah. and yeah. whatever you get rid of in the restroom uh, is your output effect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's one way to think about it. Yeah, sometimes for effect, I will, as I'm lecturing this, I'll have a bottle of water, and I'll say this is outside my system now. Now it's inside my system. And I only do the input side. I don't demonstrate the output side. But um, uh, you yeah. can you can expand your system from your body into uh, your house, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the in, for your house, the input environment would be your electricity and your water supply companies, and uh, whatever you're bringing in, and the output would be your garbage disposal or yeah. things like that. <laughs> so so you pay for input and pay for output. Right. Right. Can I make a quick comment? Sure. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, so just one thing to add on that, Brian, you mentioned that the output can actually feed back to the input, and you talked about self-determination. So I think it's it's cool, and it's true that there is a kind of flow through from input into a living system to the output, but there can also be, this is also open to anticipation. So we can get into things like Rosen, Robert Rosen's work on anticipatory systems the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. More questions? Yes, one more comment if I could with regard to the, the uh, semantics that is being deployed here, uh, because there is this fundamental issue uh, of how do you describe the uh, a system that includes the relationships between the external uh, sources and the internal sources of a particular system? Uh, more than two decades, I used the term ecoment to uh, distinguish between the the ecology, the the word ecology, which means the study of homes in in Greek, from the uh, yeah, from the noun ecomen, which includes everything within the concept space that is involved within that home. And so it's sort of a, a natural word to describe the uh, system of a living system within an ecomen or, or other ways that clearly distinguish the uh, 
notion of the entire system from the particular existent object within the system. This is purely a semantic issue, uh, or a, a way to bridge a semantic problem. Are you saying mint like M-E-N-T? Yes. So Make like it instead, of, in, instead of a moment, an eco-mint, eco-mint. Yes. Let's hear one more presentation.